All right, I've heard you. I've heard you all typing in the comment sections of these videos asking, how do you get an agent in voiceover? So we're going to talk about it. I'm going to treat this as if this is your very first agent and, or at least you're kind of at the beginning of your working with agents journey. Otherwise you wouldn't really be asking, would you? Okay. So let's jump into it. Um, first let's talk about how you know when you're prepared to even look for an agent. So different agents ask for different things, but more or less you're going to want to have a demo to show them. Um, at the beginning of your journey, you're definitely looking for agents that will want to see your commercial demo first and foremost, they already know everybody wants to be in video game and animation, but definitely send your commercial demo. If you have a video game or animation demo, hundred percent, if you're confident, send that in. But, uh, the type of demo that you're going to send is going to be determined by the kind of agency that they are, which we will talk about later whenever you do your research. So you're going to want your demo. You're going to want to talk about your credentials and your experience. So credentials, meaning how long have you been taking classes or do you do dialect coaching, or do you do singing lessons, or do you do voice acting classes or regular acting classes or improv or the whole slew of any training that you do, they want to hear about it. And they want to know how long you've been working for. If you're finding work on your own, how much work you're doing, they want to get a sense of how seasoned you are. So those are the things that you want to make sure that you have together. Um, you don't have to have a website. Uh, many voiceovers have a website and I had a website from jump, so it always worked out for me and it served me very well. So if you have a website, you're already ahead of the game and go ahead and put your website in there. Make sure it's like an online portfolio and looks nice and pretty yada, yada, yada. Okay. Step two, we're going to talk about the lay of the land. This is probably the most important part because the more you understand the lay of the land in this industry, the more you can have a sense of discretion and make better decisions for yourself because all situations are going to be a little bit different from each other. So whenever it comes to agents, the way that it works very similar to film is that you're going to be categorizing your agents in your head by region. And the reason that you do that is, um, you're going to have agreements with your agents about signing them and other agents that you sign. So for example, my very first agent was a great, is a great agency here in Texas in Houston, Texas. And they're basically the best commercial voiceover agent in the region. So when I signed with them, they made it very clear that they don't want me signing with anybody else within this region and that any future agents that I sign, uh, they want to know who it is. So you're going to find agents that say, I don't want you to have more than five agents. I don't want you to have more than three agents or seven agents. So these are conversations that you're going to have. So that's why you categorize your agents based off of region. And there's different tiers of agency. So regions, number one, tiers. So you're going to have agents that are functioning at different levels, just like anything else. So you want to familiarize yourself with what those tiers are. So for example, if you've never had an agent before and you're just getting started in voiceover and you reach out to AVO out in California, you're probably not going to hear back because they're one of the top agencies in the nation and they're the ones that are getting auditions for things like Cartoon Network or Nickelodeon or whatever they're doing up there. But that means that they have people who are definitely killing it in the voiceover industry and have been killing it for a while and know exactly what they're doing and that they get submissions all day, every day, you know, and now you are going to be standing against all those people and you don't have a lot of experience. I'm not discouraging you. I'm just saying you want to know the different tiers that you're functioning at. So, uh, you figure that out by looking at their clientele, looking at the talent that they have, uh, on their roster and kind of comparing and contrasting to see where you stand among them. 
So that's that. And then one last thing, which isn't the biggest deal in the world, but um, different agencies have different rules. So I know there's an agency up in Portland, I think, called In Both Years, and they're, they have an agreement with the VoiceOver Alliance which is a thing that says they will not hire any talent that works on pay to play sites. So that's a kind of rule that you might find with an agent. Um, for me, I submitted to them anyways, even though I'm on a pay to play because I think that's a dumb rule and the industry is changing and they can't discriminate against where you're actually finding work. But, uh, you know, you make your own decisions and there you go. You have that information. So, what I suggest is where you want to start is by looking up agencies by region. You have the East Coast, you have the West Coast, you have the Midwest, you have the South. You want to start doing a little bit of research. So for example, Atlanta is hot for film and it's hot for voiceover. Chicago, pretty hot area for voiceover. Obviously, California and New York are great for voiceover and they're highly concentrated where you're going to find a lot of agents. So you can start by looking up like if you're in Texas, like I am when I started, I was looking up voiceover agencies in Texas or if, um, you know, it's kind of like a mishmash of how you do research in general. So let's say that you're studying at an acting studio and you ask someone for some agency recommendations so you can go and see if they have a voiceover sector, things like that. But uh, essentially you wanna start collecting agents in different regions so then you have access to a wider range of auditions. So now that you kind of know what the lay of the land looks like and how to, you know, have a perspective of the way that you're going to approach this, you're gonna sit down at the computer, you're going to look up different agencies, but now what? How do you know what tier they're at? How do you know if they're right for you? How do you know anything at all? So let's say that you open one of their websites what I would do is I would immediately go to look at who their clientele is. A lot of agencies will have an entire page dedicated to their clientele because they also want to be promoting themselves to more clients. So if they have clients with Coca-Cola or Nike or I don't know, you know, just big brand names, then they're probably going to put those clients on there because it looks good for them as well. So. You go to the clientele and see if you're happy with the selection that they have. See if you feel impressed or if you're like, man, I would have loved to have worked on that or I would love to work for that company, yada, yada, yada. Then that might be an indicator that they might be a good match for you. Another way to vet an agency is by looking at their talent. So a couple considerations, you're going to have a lot of agencies that do big cattle call condition conditions. You're going to have a lot of agencies that do big cattle call auditions where they have like 300 people on their roster of your demographic even, and they're sending all of you guys to the same audition. And that's that clients don't necessarily limit themselves to a single agency when they're looking for a certain role. So they might be entertaining two different agencies, both of which that are sending them hundreds of auditions. And now your voice is getting drowned out in the sea of voices, right? And it's going to be a lot harder to stand out. It's the way of the world especially whenever you're first getting started. So that's why just to be aware, you're going to have a lot of voiceovers at the beginning of their career that are generating a lot of their work on their own. Okay. I hope I'm not rambling. Okay. So go look at the talent that they have signed. So they're going to have a talent roster list. It's usually alphabetically sorted. And click on one and listen to that person's demos, go online, type in their name and see if they have a website that's easy to find. And you're just going to kind of go like that. You know, you don't have to look at every single one, but kind of cherry pick, see like, oh, okay. You know, she doesn't sound like me. I haven't found anyone on their roster that sounds like me. So 
they might be inclined to reach out to me because they're looking for variety of talent to present to the clients. Or they have a lot of people in my demographic, but I definitely think that my demo and where I'm at in my craft will stand apart from the options that they have. So they might be inclined to get back to me. These are the ways that you wanna be thinking. You wanna be thinking about what the agents want and need out of their roster and how you're going to fit in with their team. Okay, well, that was pretty simple. So now that you've narrowed it down, I would say compile an Excel list or, you know, handwritten list, whatever you keep your lists on. But I would say compile a list of all the agencies that you're looking at and be aware of what region they're in. And then start going to, when you're ready to submit, you have all your materials together, go to their website and Usually they have information about how to submit to them. They're used to getting submissions. They get submissions all day, every day, and they have different rules for each of them. Some of them want you to submit online. Some of them want you to just email a bunch of, you know, the information that they're asking for. Some of them want links to your demos. Some of them don't want links and they want downloadable MP3 files. Um, whatever it is, they're going to tell you what they want. And at this point, I would say that any moment that you get to try to distinguish yourself or catch their attention, uh, that's where you're going to kind of be a bit savvy about it. So if you're sending an email, make sure that your email is concise, clear, and shows a bit of your personality. I remember whenever I landed my very first agent, I had already done like 1500 voiceovers. I was full-time already all self-generated and that is definitely something to put forth because they're like hey they obviously have clients who are returning to them they have a lot of experience so i put that foot forward and then i wrote this like very quirky email and my resume was you know nicely laid out to where you didn't have to read a lot you know i was trying to think of what would be fun for them to look at and how do i get as much information about me across to them as possible in the shortest amount of time so that's probably the approach that you should and will take yeah i mean that's about it so um, as far as expectations go, because expectations are crucial when you're starting your own business and in this craft as well. So, uh, it is absolutely normal, especially if you're reaching out to larger agencies or, I mean, you, you just never know why somebody doesn't get back to you, but it's important to understand that it is very normal for people not to answer you. Um, the last thing you want to do is have like a self-sabotage situation where you keep following up with them. And I know that happens with agencies all the time because on their own websites, they are so reactive. No, Luna. On their websites, they're kind of reactive and, you know, they make, uh, they say like, don't reach out to us again, submit it once and don't follow up. And it kind of, it's a bit intimidating, but it is because they're used to people who uh, are nervous and not quite as confident in their work as they should be. And they have people that are just following up with them all day long. Like, hey, have you seen this? Hey, have you listened to it? And it's like, you're not going to get a date with that kind of attitude. So uh, it's normal not to hear back. Follow the guidelines of what they've set forth as best as you can. If six months have passed and you really want to submit again, then you know, that's your own decision, but it's normal not to hear back, which is why you want a full running list. Make yourself a schedule. You're going to reach out to this agent this week. Let it sit for maybe a week, then reach out to the next agent. Let that sit. Or maybe you want to reach out to 10 agents in a day, which is a hundred percent cool and valid. And, um, yeah, don't think that just because you sent an email, it's gonna guarantee you any kind of meeting whatsoever. So the next step, I'll just let you know this, and then I'll wrap this up. If you've submitted to an agency, they will, in all of my experiences, I have three agencies and a manager, and the manager is basically working kind of as an agency. So, um, they will look at your materials when they get around to it. It could take a month. 
it could take a day, it could take a year, who knows? But they'll get around to looking at your materials and if they're interested, they will reach out to you for a follow-up meeting. And in that follow-up meeting, it's usually not very long. I think they usually last like 15 to 20 minutes and they're going to kind of suss you out a little bit they're gonna ask you questions, get a sense of who you are, get a sense of how much you're working, and see how comfortable you are even just in the setting of speaking to a manager. Um, so they're gonna sit down and have a little chat with you and you're gonna want to already know what you want to say during that meeting. This is just good preparation in general. So what I would suggest is if, if the agent was to reach out to you and say, Hey, I listened to your stuff. It sounds great. Uh, when do you have time to sit down for a quick 15 minute chat? And then you schedule your chat. What I would do is go back to that agent that reached back out to you and re look over all of their stuff. So you can remind yourself of, of their specs since you've been reaching out to a lot of people already look at their clientele, look at their talents, just familiarize yourself with them and have thoughts about what you've seen, positive thoughts about what you've seen. So you have things to comment on. So one of the things that I did when I got my first agent was I looked up any names that I could find on their team. I looked them up personally online and I found a podcast that the founder of the agency uh, was a guest on and she was the one that was going to have the one-on-one -on -one meeting with me. So I listened to that podcast and listened to the things that she said and made notes of the things that I liked that if the opportunity presented itself, I could mention it in that 15 minute meeting to show that I am doing my research. I'm interested in the things that she said and that she and I connect with certain ideas that she believes in, right? So you wanna make that connection. Another thing that I did was I had two lists. I had a list of things that I wanted to make sure she knew about me. So I wanted to make sure that if she asked these questions that I already had prepared answers for them about, you know, maybe a couple of the biggest projects that you've worked on that you're proud of. So if you had, you know, um, if you had a spot with Amazon, that's a big brand name. That's something to put out there, right? That's something that they might want to know that you're already working at these higher levels. Uh, I wanted her to know the experience that I had. So at that point I was already doing voiceover for four or five years. And like I said, I had done, you know, 1500 projects and I wanted to communicate that exactly what I said earlier. I had repeat clients. I had worked on my business skills and I know how to handle myself in that business voiceover environment and that I had enough experience that she could trust sending me forth to auditions without having to keep an eye on me, knowing that what I'm putting uh, forth in my auditions is of an acceptable level to represent her agency. So that's another thing. So you make a list of the things that you want them to know about you, uh, just in case it comes up and you have the opportunity to say so. And then my other list were things that I wanted to know about them. And I think it's a good idea to have questions for them to show that you're thinking and to show that you have your own desires and it makes you look a little bit less desperate because desperation is like the plague in the industry. So you want to make sure that you're also vetting them to make sure that they're a good fit for you. It works both ways. So some questions that you might have for them are, you want to know how big their roster is. You want to know, you know, I tend to ask them what their goals are for the coming year for growth, what their focuses are. So if they really only focus on commercial, that's a good thing to know. And this is a good time to find that out. And that's totally fine if they do, but it gives you information about how you're going to navigate things moving forward. Um, you can ask them about 
how they tend to have a relationship with their talent. Do they keep up with their talent? Are they in regular contact with their talent? Do they have 600 people on their roster? If they do have a lot of people, how many of those are really active? How often should you expect to be auditioning for them? Things like that um, would be good questions to ask. So that's all I got for you. I think that was pretty concise. If anything's confusing, let me know and good luck. Bye.